Thanks for the intro, Mega. And uh, I hope I can add some more info on the uh, React Native, especially for you. Uh, so let's begin. Right. Just one moment, yeah. Hello, React Bangalore. My name is Shesh Zibu. And, and uh, I'm here to talk about offering work from React Native with Watermelon DB. So a little about myself. I'm working at Anorop Tech right now as a senior software developer. Uh, you can see on the screen social links for my profiles and our company's profile as well. We are hiring right now. So if you're interested after the talk, maybe give us a call, send us a message, uh, you know how it goes. OK, so let's begin with Watermelon DB. What exactly is Watermelon DB? Watermelon DB is a JavaScript wrapper library over SQLite, and it's meant to be cross-platform. So the main thing about being cross-platform is it is based on uh, SQLite DB itself on React Native only. When you try to load it in the browser, it works on Loki JS, which is an in-memory database specifically designed for browsers. On React Native, it runs the query on separate native thread, which means our main thread is free from all the database activities and specially used for UI only. It uses observable data bindings. That means we can easily connect it with React for state management, state updates, and re-rendering. It has lazy loading. So the biggest problem with Redux, Redux persist, and all of those uh, J, J, JavaScript object-based data libraries is that the entire data is loaded in memory at one go. But the problem is we don't actually need all the data in one go. So wouldn't it be better if we load the data as and when we need it? That is the entire philosophy of Watermelon DB, and uh, that's why it's better for React Native than any uh, JS memory-based data management library. Also, it focuses on speed. Now, the speed word here is ambiguous. Definitely, the library wants to be fast in the processing of internal data, but also it wants to provide a speedy interaction for the user. What I mean by that is, when I run a SQL query, I don't want the query to load all the data and for all the results, but only bring the, the smallest set of results that we need to show on the screen and that can actually fit on the screen. So uh, if we talk about the SQL, SQL clauses, we would have things like limit and offset. These, these are implemented in Watermelon DB as well, but in slightly different names. They're called take, skip by, and so on and so forth. You can learn more about the library itself on Nosby Watermelon DB website. All the links in the website are on the, on the presentation are interactive, so you can open whichever you want. Let's go to how to set up Watermelon DB itself. So one of the first things we need to do is in install Watermelon DB. Now, since it is a database library, it's not as trivial as just adding the package itself. What we need to do is definitely add the package, but that's only the beginning. Next, we need to add Babel plugin for decorators. That's because Watermelon DB relies heavily on decorator usage to define models and connect it with the, the schema file that is stored on the device. After installing these packages, we need to enable them in a Babel config file and enable the decorators feature in TypeScript config if we are using TypeScript. Second, for Android, we need to enable a new property called Kotlin version. The entire library of Watermelon DB Android site is written in Kotlin. So we need the new, the new version to make it work properly. For iOS setup, uh, I'll be honest with you guys, I haven't worked on iOS. So I wouldn't know exactly what is going on here, but this is the bare minimum setup that we need. Next up is the connect phase. Once you install the entire DB libraries, what we need to do is define a schema for our data that is used to store the data in SQLite DB itself. Next, create a model. The difference between the model and schema is whatever data is stored in the SQLite DB, it might not be usable directly in JavaScript or vice versa. So we need this class to load the data from SQLite and make it usable in JavaScript land. Once we do that for all our schemas and models, we can connect them to our adapter, pass the adapter to a database class, and then we have our database connected. Next is setting up with React. So, so far, the database has been React agnostic. You can create it and use it for any library, but since this is a React conference, let's see how we can use it with React. So in similar fashion to Redux, we have a provider. We pass in our database to it. And then in any component, we can connect it and load the data and observe it. So the keyword here is observe it. What this means is whenever the data changes in the DB, my React UI will also update automatically. I don't have to manage state myself. This is similar to how Connect works in Redux. But the special thing about this is, if I'm observing three different records, so let's say I'm working in a library kind of application, I have 
uh, multiple posts and each post has some comments. If I observe three posts, anytime any of those posts updates on the screen, my, uh, my database will also track the updates. And if the data updates in the database itself, my screen will update in reaction. Second thing we can do is observe the entire table or collections if you prefer that. And that means whenever I create or delete any entity in a table, the entire list will be updated, but not the individual items. To observe the individual items, we have to observe them separately. This is how we would create any entity. So uh, what we do is get the collection from the database, call the right method on it, and then pass a create function. The create function accepts under the callback, which is passed in a record. So the post entity in the callback over here is a dirty entity. We can do whatever we want. No immutability is here. Uh, assign any properties like you would in any other JavaScript variable. The entire library is async. So we need to add await all the places. And once we do that, we're done. So one thing we'd look at here is maybe it's not a good idea to always pass in the database directly and then call the collections and the right functions. Uh, we can add different helper methods on different model classes. So in this example, you can see on a post, if I want to add a comment, I can simply have another function called add comment that will handle all the things related to database. Okay, now that we've done with the basics, we just started with the sync. In offline databases, sync syncing data with the server is the biggest challenge. And that's because the data can be large in volumes. There can be network issues, application issues on the server side. There can be problems with the data consistency. And we'll see exactly what I mean by that. Okay, first thing is sync with chain sets. This is the default operation mode of watermelon DB. What this means is whenever I want to sync data on the server, I don't actually provide the data, but I segregate the data in tables. In each table, I need to maintain a set of changes and those changes have to be accepted by the database itself. Let's look at what the changes. So here we have a type ID, which is a string. That's because watermelon DB follows string IDs, a type raw, which denotes a raw record. I've only written ID because different records will have different fields like title, name, age, date of birth, updated at, created at, all those things. The next thing is the interested, interesting part, and that is the table change set. What this means is for any table, if I want to sync it on the database, I need to provide a list of things. If I created or updated a record, give me the record itself. If I'm deleting it, just give me the ID. Then I need to aggregate all these things for the entire database, for all the tables, upload them to the server, and then server has to return in the same shape. This brings us to our mental model of the sync operation that Watermelon follows. We have to pull the changes from server, resolve any conflicts, and then push the updated data back to the server. In resolution strategy, it is similar to how Git would do it with, our, with the strategy called hours, which means local changes always then. And the keyword here is changes. So it might happen that I have the same data on server and client. That means there are no merge conflicts. Uh, it might happen that on a single object, let's say a post object, the title has changed on server, but it hasn't changed on the client yet. That means that we'll copy the server title. In case, let's say the title has changed on both the server and client. Now that is a merge conflict. And that is where we observe that watermelon DB picks the local changes, which is great because we don't have to work on the merge conflict resolution itself. Here's the bare minimum implementation of a synchronization call. So the main thing here is we are importing a synchronized function from watermelon DB sync. This entire function handles everything related to diff sync, partial updates, patch updates, and anything that you would expect in a manual solution. The only thing we need to provide is a function called pull changes that connects with the server, another called push changes that connect to the server for pushing the data and pulling the data. And this is it. So this seems like a pretty sweet solution, if you ask me. Uh, but there's a problem. Actually, there are a few problems. First of the problem is the entire database is synced at once. And that means if I have a lot of collections in my off offline database, uh, let's say I was working offline for the past week, I need to update the entire thing in one go. If it fails in between, I don't exactly know what state my app might end in. Second is the changes are synced in bulk. So different and similar to the previous one, but let's see all the differences. Uh, if I have a single entity, let's say I'm creating a meeting on Google Meet, I create this meeting, add some people, remove some people, change the time, add a link, and do all these changes. 
I would prefer if Google would show me the entire history of my actions. But in bulk changes, that's not possible. Bulk changes only track the initial and final state. That means I'm losing the granular activity that has performed on the entities. Another problem is API must be watermelon in a way. Like I said just a few minutes ago, we have to provide a chain set to the server, and server has to provide another chain set back to us. That means if we have an existing system where a sync implementation has already been made, we have to rewrite the whole thing to suit watermelon needs. And that is not a good idea. But there's one more problem, and that is lack of customization and flexibility. So if I go back a few slides, yeah. As you can see, there is a lot of whole change to uh, how we can override the merge conflict resolution, how we can perform granular changes on a record basis or on a table basis. What if we want to control that if one action fails, do something to inform the user, and if some other action fails, unroll the entire transaction in the local DB. These things are impossible in Watermelon DB because of its bare bones implementation. So what we need is a custom solution. For that custom solution at Analog Tech, we have created our own uh, synchronization tool. I, I would like to call it a package, but it's not, not even close to a package. So it is a tool. Uh, what we do is, for every action that the user takes on our application, we add it to a queue of actions. A queue because it ensures that sequential processing of actions is uh, happening on the sync protocol. We upload individual actions on the server, and the server applies the individual actions on the server database to recreate the data that we have on the client, hopefully. In case that doesn't happen, we'll see what happens next. So let's say this is the post and the comment that I've been talking about. And these are some models I'm using on my sales application. Now, there are a few ac actions that can happen on my device, such as a create post, delete post, and create comment. Notice that this is not a generic action. So there is no uh, update, delete, CRUD, or other CRUD actions. I'm very hyper-focused on things that my application is supposed to do. So in my, app, in my application, once I have my action types defined, I will say, for each action that I want to do, action type has to be one of these things. There will be a comment ID, post ID, and any other entity ID that I have. Uh, people who have experience in Rails might notice that this is a good place for polymorphic relations. But there is a problem with watermelon DB in polymorphism, and we'll see how it goes. Next up. Yeah, so this is how we create a post now. Instead of just creating a post and adding it to the database, I also have to create an action denoting that the user has created a post with so-and-so title and whatever the body is. I need a new sync function that handles each case individually, calls the APIs with the entire payload or in ID or both, and then returns whatever response has been processed. One of the new problems that we now face is ID matching. So what this means is, Whenever I'm creating an entity on my app, we have to create the same entity on the server, but the IDs might not be the same. So how will my app keep a track of what entity was created on server? Uh, this is not a new problem. This has been existing in all kinds of offline systems that are synced with an online or remote location. And uh, so there are a few solutions that are disposable, one of which is ID matching with global IDs. What this means is anything that is created on the app will have a globally unique ID. And we can use that single ID on our database as well. But uh, it doesn't already, it doesn't always work. Uh, let's see. Okay, I'm missing a few slides here. Okay, this year. So it doesn't always work because there are some databases that only work with integer IDs, MySQL, PostgreSQL, and many other databases. And another problem that we generally face is UUID generation on the client might not be unique on the client itself. If an app resets and we're using some secret to generate the IDs, it might not work again. So the next solution is ID matching with ID pairs. What are ID pairs? Well, we maintain two separate IDs for each record, one for the client and one for the server. On the server, we call them client ID and ID. And on the app, we call them app ID and ID. Uh, this sounds a bit pretty confusing, but the overall idea is very simple. These pair of IDs will be unique for every record. And that is the keyword here, the pair is unique. So what this means is every time when I'm creating something on the app, the app ID will remain fixed. And when this, once it's created on the server, the server ID will be generated on the server. But the server will also track what client ID was created. In response, I will get both pair of IDs, and I can easily match. Or a client ID ABC, server ID has to be 123. And I'll update the records accordingly. 
the problem on this kind of system is it's not always trivial to add new fields on each table in multiple databases across different servers. So it might work for a small organization with a few distributed systems, but as the te technological complexity grows, this might not span out well. This brings us to our final solution, and that is ID Cascade. Now, the problem with ID Cascade is the complexity goes through the roof. Uh, what, we, what I mean by that is we need to maintain two IDs on our app, but only one on the server. App ID is a string, again, that is generated by watermelon DB. It will always exist on the app, and we can use it to stitch together our data on the app side, use for our UI navigations, uh, and any other activity that we want to perform on app, that should always work. Server ID is the ID that's created by the server database, and only when the API is successful. That means once I create a post on server, I will get the server ID, and I can use it for any subsequent API calls as well. So here's an example of an action model. This is a model that we'll use for synchronizing our offline database with the server. As you can see, there is a table called actions, an associations block that tells that the action belongs to post and belongs to comments. There are the two fields, type and payload, which denote what kind of action it is and what is the payload associated with the action. And then two relations called post and comment. These, uh, these are relations tell me that this particular action belongs to some post and some comment. Now, again, as I was talking about polymorphic relations, it might again look like it's better to have a single field called entity type and another field called entity ID that can, that can be used in convention to denote what post or what comment was used here. But there are a few challenges in watermelon DB in tracking what in, uh, tracking polymorphic relations, and we'll see next what, what the problems are. So after creating the app model, we have to update our schemas. We need to add the server ID to our schema and add the same field to our model. We also need to add the association, saying that the model has multiple actions. Once you do that, we have to write this whole code. Now, this is the code that we use for synchronizing our data. Uh, let's see it piece by piece what's going on here. So this is the same function, but I've collapsed the switch block so we can see around the block. First, we get our entities that were tagged on the action. We create an updates list, which is supposed to be an array of models. And something happens in the switch block, we don't really know right now. But at the end of the block, we will add another action that says, prepare the current action for destruction. So if my action is synced on the server properly, I would like to delete it. Once all my updates are ready, I can simply pass into database for processing. Let's see what happens inside the switch block on a case by case basis. The first case is a create post. When I want to create a post, I just need the payload. There is no ID present for the server. Pass it to the server. Server will return me some entity. That entity can be used to update our local, in, local records. So uh, it might look like, again, this is overkill. What if, why can't we just replace the IDs that were returned by the server? That's because Watermelon DB works on assumption that the record's ID will never change. Why that says is uh, beyond the scope of this talk. But you have to touch me on this. Record IDs are immutable in Watermelon DB. We have to do something similar for create comment. In this case, we are using post or server ID. This server ID was this server ID is coming from the post that we plugged at the top of the switch block, and that was assigned inside the create post callback. Now, what we do is uh, run the API, get the response, and update the comment fields so that our comment is also synced on server. In case you want to delete something, we have another step that was not seen previously. Fetch all the children for the model that you want to delete, prepare each child for deletion, and then delete the record itself. That way, we have a clean deletion in case of foreign key cascades. And that was about it. Thanks for joining.